throw it over to Mark Fischler. Hello. Uh, welcome to this workshop. Um, I'm Mark Fischler, and I um, am a professor in the uh, Criminal Justice Department, and I've been here for 16 years, and uh, been advising students that whole time, and I've had some other fun, different roles that have exposed me to issues related to advising, but certainly way beyond CJ. So here we go. So advising, pieces to consider. Uh, I'm here because, uh, you know, the social gap is widening. Uh, the number of, uh, of students <clears throat> that, uh, you know, on the poor end that were able to go to school in the 70s, Versus now, it's 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 we we have more access to college in ways, but the <clears throat> the individuals and the the income is is just it's it's it makes it more difficult and it's it's a problem. So I care about that and I want to help those that are um, you know which are many of our students have a better shot at succeeding and it's really important that. They get through so because <clears throat> as I say we kind of meet folks at the world centric stage and what I mean by that is that the world is uh, in some ways as Thomas Friedman talks about he talks about the world getting flatter um, we are an interconnected species and the complexity of the world and the problems that we face require us to be far beyond kind of an ethnocentric uh, our country first kind of mentality and college is a not the only gateway to get you there but it's certainly one of the best and so to um, you know as as we see the complexity of the problems that we face we've got to help people get there so helping folks through advising is a most be beautiful vehicle to help folks realize their potential and you think about it think about people who have given you advice in your life and the magical difference that it's made. You know, I think about <clears throat> John Kaiser, uh, one of my political philosophy professors, like pulling me aside and saying, you know, thinking I had graduated and asking me why I wasn't in law school. And then having a sit down conversation that really changed the trajectory of where I was going and even what I was thinking of doing. And I could go on with different individuals like that. And I think you could too. I think each and every one of you have had individuals that have been <clears throat> life changers in terms of the advice that they have given. So I want to play that forward and I think we all do. We want to play it forward. So getting advising right, um, it requires a lot of different things. I'm going to throw a lot of different things at, at you today. Um, understanding retention and the issues in play. Uh, understanding what it takes for a student to be successful in and out of the size of the classroom. Understanding our situation, our load, our resources, and who we are in the process. And understanding some approaches that might help us on the path. So those are the things that I hope to kind of walk through with you and talk about today. And certainly I'm not uh, expecting us, it's going to be a little bit more Socratic in the sense that uh, we shouldn't be getting full answers here, but these, the questions that we should raise should bring more processes forward. So understanding retention and what hurts us. Um, let's be honest, the quality of academic preparation hurts us. And what can we do about it? Um, <clears throat> you know, we uh, have looked at some of the numbers in CJ just as an example. Uh, about 50 of our majors are coming in with a 243 GPA or less. Uh, and, and that, you know, speaks to. Um, it speaks to their academic preparation, and and so that is something that we are all dealing with. And, and as at, at a public institution, uh, in the you know the rural country of the Northeast, that's something that we've got to be aware of. Uh, quality of academic enga engagement hurts us. Taking advantage of resources, quality connections with advisors and professors, credit hours hurts us. Meaning. <clears throat> You know, students that uh, the retention research is pretty clear that students that are at 15 or above credits uh, are are more retained than students that don't. Um, and in the, 
the stuff about taking advantages of resources and things like that, <clears throat> I put together a number of years ago what David Zero is using now, uh, which is our um, which is our approach to kind of asking students when they leave here, why are they leaving Plymouth State University? So we're getting a lot more information uh, in terms of who our students are that kind of that are moving on. Social engagement. Establishing friendships with peers is hard in this day and age. Connecting with faculty staff is hard for students. Joining clubs, organizations, attending programs. What can we do about it? You know, it's really interesting. Um, I am running right now something called Mindful Inquiry, which is uh, uh, it's, it's for an open group of students that just want to get together to go to the deeper end of the pool to talk about things in a more meaningful way. And it's, um, they are incredible students, and I, uh, it's, it, this has been an ongoing process every Thursday and Friday now. Um, and what I'm seeing is these things that I just mentioned, is that th even though we have these devices, right, that connect us with everybody, but loneliness is high. Uh, feeling disconnected, as learning, uh, dealing with social anxiety is incredibly high. Depression is high. And so, um, a lot of these folks have a hard time connecting. And, and, and my, the folks that are coming are the folks that are honest enough about it and are working on it and are actually building the skill sets to, to make those things happen. But what can we do about it, right? So what can we do to support our students? And part of it is just raising our level of consciousness to understand that that's going on. Finances, right? I mean, this is, it's not getting better, right? It's, it's getting worse that it's, <clears throat> it's 30 plus thousand bucks a year. Students are carrying, I mean, I, the average debt is somewhere, I think, in 30 or 40 thousand dollars when they leave here, right? Um, that's average, right? So there, there's a lot, that means there's a lot of students that come here that, that have families that could support them, like maybe someone like me, if I came to Plymouth State, I would have had that, you know, level of support. but. That means that so many students are way above the 40 number that Robin mentioned. That is gonna devastate, that is, that's a big deal for the rest of your life. I read a friend on Facebook who was like 18 years out of college and they were celebrating that they just went debt free. I'm gonna use the internet and say, Kristen Stelmach, you're watching from home. Why don't you Google the average debt in New Hampshire and let me know what it is. Right on. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> Maybe she's got us <laughs> muted, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Which would be really wise of her, considering no. I'm speaking. Um, so, so, so many students need financial aid, the cost keeps going up every year, student debt is out of control. What can we do to help a student get through <laughs> school in a timely manner and get work site? And actually, that's another retention thing that I've learned in deep diving with some of the experts on the world stage, that folks that do work study are uh, far more apt to stay at the school. I know this is not a retention workshop, but mm -hmm. retention certainly does play a role. So understanding what it takes to succeed in, in college, factors. <clears throat> you know, understanding the why of college. What is the value behind the college uh, education? Do your advisees hear from you about why it matters, right? So, you know, not just talking about your subject matter, not just talking about how cool it is to be in school if they're undeclared, but what's the why behind this? And, uh, and, and, and I, I didn't write it there, but you know, why does it matter to you? Why are you here? And do they know that, right? What's, what's the passion? Because we all have, I did another workshop last week, but we all do on some level intuitively have an evolutionary purpose for why we're here something here that we want to make the world a better place. It's not just about us. We could, if it was just about us, we'd be doing something else. Certainly not at a public institution like that. And then, do you know why it matters to them? So, <clears throat> understanding the, the why, but have we dug in enough to know their why? Setting goals. Students who set goals do better than those that don't. Um, have you had a conversation with your advisee about their goals for the semester, the, the week, the year? You remember, these can be done in group settings. Professors, we do it all the time. We can 
<clears throat> you can actually use class time. It, just because we have advisees um, that are one-on-one -on -one and we have their, you know, the ID number to get them, or, you know, their PIN number, we're still advising students in the classroom. You know, the advising goes well beyond that. Time management is a key to success. So talking to our students about what tools are your students using and what have you introduced to them in terms of why that's important. I mean, none of us would be where we are right now with a certain level of time management, right? You know, you can look at my phone and you can see all the built-in different things that I have into the calendar, even like beer dates with friends. <laughs> uh, understanding what it takes to succeed in college continued. Uh, emotional awareness and intelligence, things like resilience, growth mindset, work by Andrea Duckworth, Jean Twang, uh, think, uh, growth mindset, how to balance priorities, how to manage anxieties from tests and papers. Question, have you introduced the growth mindset to your students? Have you shared your own personal experiences of its impact on your path? A number of years ago, I did a video when I was Dean of the First Year Experience where we had students talk about some tough times and how they got, it, got through that as kind of a, an example. We had a lot of people that watched it, but it was kind of a way to say, we can do this, uh, but this resilience factor in what we're seeing with this generation, it's, it's tough. And so what can we do to introduce those skill sets that are gonna help them be successful? becoming a critical thinker, helping students understand that its importance and how they can gain those skills in the classroom and in their personal life through their decision making. It doesn't have to be just in the classroom. There are, another, there are a number of decisions that they're making outside the classroom that require critical thinking. And sometimes we're not always using it at Saturday night at midnight. But it's critical, especially I can tell you right now, for the CJ students that certainly want to get into law enforcement, they better be critical thinkers or they're never gonna have a career in law enforcement. They're gonna waste their four years. And I've had some beautiful students that, you know, and maybe it was for the best in the long run, but their career in law enforcement went down the tubes based on some non-critical thinking-based decisions. Uh, becoming an active reader, taking notes and various methodologies for student success. Uh, I remember I had a law school professor, David Gregory, probably the greatest teaching professor I've ever had the fortune of being in front of. And, you know, I remember asking him, like, Professor Gregory, after I graduated, it's like, is there a book that you recommend? And he said, how to read a book, uh, and uh, which is an interesting book. Uh, I would just, you know, recommend people take a look at that. But anyways, becoming an active reader is what a lot of it's about. Being an engaged learner in the classroom, how to prepare and participate in class, how to study, sending on techniques on how to deeply learn. All of these things can be discussed with our students. All of this is an opportunity that we have to connect, really too, to connect with our students. How to test take, handle anxiety, getting them the right resources, how to write papers, getting them to the right resources, handling a diverse society and environment, embracing opportunity, finances, understanding that financial aid and budgeting, Think about your future, career, major, who do you want to be and why. Now, I recognize that is a lot. That is a ton. And you can't be expected to be an expert in all of those different areas. Nor should you, I don't, I'm not going to recommend anyone to attempt to try to be an expert in all of those different areas. But you are expected to understand that they, these are the tools for success and where they might be able to go to help your students get those resources that they need. That is, I consider, a part of our moral obligation as advisors. <clears throat> so based on what I just presented to you, can you identify, just you know, run through your head for a moment, no one has to speak out loud, either through PSU or other resources where students can learn the skills we've just shared. Can you be ready for that? Because our students need that. So, hey, the average student loan debt in New Hampshire at graduation is thirty-six thousand dollars. Wow! In twenty eighteen. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Kristen. Appreciate that. Yeah. 
I was so excited to get that information and how cool it was to get it over the video and then I just occurred to me that what I was saying was not fun or happy so excuse my tone and I was like oh this didn't look good. Hey, thank you for it's providing terribly sad information yeah. to us Chris. That's, that's crazy. So advising methods so we've taken this opportunity to look at some some of the whys some of the things to consider uh, why this is all important, but let's look at, I'm gonna introduce three different methods, and actually one is from a former PSU employee, Pat Kate, who I had the pleasure of working with. Uh, he worked with the nursing. He was great. He worked with the nursing advisors. And don't we think advisors. it's ironic that our best advisor just got pulled out of this meeting because she had to go advise a student and she can't <laughs> stay, so she'll have to catch it on Thank the replay. You, Anna. Yeah. Oh. So Pat came up with something called the targeted advising model. And what I just wanna say is that Pat, I think he learned over time, I think he, he called himself a helicopter kind of advisor, which I think a lot of us, all of us here are very caring individuals, uh, you know, would be in some ways, but he realized that it wasn't very effective. And this model that he introduced for his undeclared population, you know, we talk about that drive for 85, or we used to talk about that drive for 85. Well, this model with the undeclared population, for those that declared at the end of their first year, 86% were retained. So that's not, so that it, it didn't work as well for those that didn't declare at the end of their first year, but 86%, I think the other number was like in the 50s. But that's pretty impressive. So I thought, um, you know, I, I studied up on it, I read about it, and, you know, I've talked to Pat about it. Um, and this is what I learned through Pat. Um, so students who are undeclared, and I guess this is why this model is important, is that almost, you know, um, I don't know the exact number of students. The undeclared is like the largest major on this campus coming onto campus. Mm -hmm. But then in addition to that, over 45% of our students switch their major anyway. So I think it's fair to almost look, and, and I think about all of us and our career trajectory, maybe Jeremiah excluded, but most of us have kind of switched up some of our areas and focus. And maybe, maybe you did too. I went to the Peace Corps after grad school. Okay, there you, there you go. There you go. You had nothing to do with chemistry. I tried to get off the track. You did. Not. <laughs> that's true. That would probably qualify as some of that dissonance that's mentioned there. So yeah, that. yeah. Well, and that you'd expect dissonance mm -hmm. with this undeclared population, but there isn't what he found. Um, so everybody, so dissonance is kind of like this discomfort where you have an ideal over here, you see that you're not measuring there, and you know, the old Mike Fischler, my dad, you know, dissonance leads to growth, and <laughs> all that, that's, Pat would, <laughs> Pat would use that. So anyways, he found that students that were undeclared, you'd expect dissonance for not knowing their major, but in fact, many didn't have any dissonance at all. And he, what he found was that the students were engaged, well, they weren't engaged with the process of finding out what they wanted to be or learn more about. So they were just kind of disconnected from it all. The, and so what he found was that there were kind of different stages of the process. So stage one is this kind of pre-contemplation stage and identity diffusion. It's kind of all together. Uh, so in this one, they're unlikely to respond to action-oriented tasks, no desire to participate. Make decision on short-term needs, versus long-term desires. They exhibit identity diffusion, he calls it. They are uh, pretty carefree about not having a major and they have a tendency to miss advising meetings or just kind of disconnected from the process. And, uh, and part of this is identity foreclosure. So folks decide on a major based on outside extrinsic sources like mom and dad. So mom and dad, how, how many times have you heard that? Like, well, mom and dad said that was a really good major and I could make a lot of money doing that. And so they told me, you know, that would be a really good thing for me to do, and so therefore, I'm going to do that. And it's like, okay, well, what do you actually really want to do, right? Well, I don't know, I'm a mom and dad, you know, they would repeat the mantra. So that's a problem. So with folks at this point, uh, at this point must really test their commitment. 
Uh, providing career information at this stage doesn't engage them. Better served if the advisor helps them understand the why of having a major is important in the service to their lives. So getting back to that why that we talked about earlier on. Uh, when they get the why, they are more open for exploration. So you got to create the dissonance to help them get this done. So, uh, so the students got to see the discrepancy between where their present state is, is undecided, and what they could be with being engaged in a major. So seeing that, wow, this kind of disconnect, this disengagement in this process is really not serving me. Frank talked about the benefits of being declared and the negatives of being undeclared. And, and, and I, would, I'm, I'm, I would be careful with that because I, I actually say to a lot of students, I think it's great to be undeclared. But when I say that, I don't always get to finish it by saying, but you need to be engaged in the process, which is what Pat is talking about. So undeclared, disengaged, big problem. Uh, so the key is to guide the student to move from relying on extrinsic motivators to developing intrinsic motivation. And that's the key to long-term success too. And, and you know, I, I actually have a, a, a very close friend who uh, worked with Arne Duncan in changing the public schools in Chicago. And that, we, that was always his mantra, was intrinsic motivation. Stop giving me the, you know, the, I hate spelling bees, I hate all those things, because there's these external rewards, and the kids have got to love learning for the love of learning, and that's what we've got to do. So deliberation is the next major step. Main goal of this stage is, this, is the, that the student discovers information needed to make personally relevant decisions about their major. Career, so career exploration at this stage does matter. <coughs> Assessments can be used here. Student awareness of their personal values. Need to help them become effective decision makers here. Process more important than outcome. So students might have a hard time making the decision, so a lot of back and forth with the advisor could be necessary. So all of this is really pushing our students to start to own their educational experience. And folks that own their educational experience have, have uh, get through college and have a better sense of who they are and where they need to go. And then we move to the action stage. Students at this stage need less hand-holding. They have the desire to choose a major, the information needed about themselves, and they have an adequate understanding of degree and career options. Now the student just needs to act, and we help administer them to that. So core principles, share empathy, shared experience, build a personal relationship, support self-efficacy, help them take control, and roll with the resistance. Don't roll away from the resistance, roll with the resistance. So that's one model. And I'm just gonna introduce two others. This is just to get the conversation started. There are a lot. If you go to the Nakata website, Marianne, are you part of Nakata? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot, and yes. from my kind of, what I would call my integral perspective, we say they're all really, they all have a partial piece of the truth. There's mm -hmm. all, there's there's something there, and, and I would encourage you. But I just, I picked a couple that I've played around with myself in terms of an advisor that I wanted to talk to you all about. So one is called intrusive advising, and this is, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing where you're building, you know, personal relationships off the bat. Um, you, you're seeing, you're, you're showing up uh, at campus events, different things that they're going to be at. Um, you know, I'm going to be prepared in an advising appointment with students so that they kind of know I'm fully present with them. Um, I might, in a situation like that, ask a whole lot of questions of them before I ever meet them. You know, what are you into? What do you like? What do you dislike? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite city? Get a bunch of different information. What do you enjoy? All those different things. Um, you know, ask questions to make appropriate referrals. If students understand why we ask questions, they welcome the deep dive into their existence. Sample questions, do you work or have a family in addition? to going to school, how many hours do you work? What are you thinking about doing with your degree? What's a good course, you know, what's a good course schedule look like to you? You know, uh, a lot of this is, 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 as opposed to imposing ourselves, it's being curious about them so that I have the right amount of information to be of greater service to them. 
How do you feel about grades or what you want to accomplish here? What challenges do you anticipate or do you face in the past that got in the way of your success? And from here, we get them the right services they need, which, uh, you know, I think everybody does here well. I think we do as an institution uh, take that upon ourselves to try to, just like everyone here was like, oh, you're Marianne, right? Like you've taken those, those things that Marianne has sent out seriously, right? You, you haven't like messed around with that. You've taken it, you know, when she calls, you know, Marianne calls me and she needs help. I'm, you know, I'm going to be on the phone with her to make sure we're, 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 we're going to help that student make it work. Um, so maintain regular eye uh, contact with them, emails, positive things heard, or learn through grades. I'm going to have a lot of feedback with them. I remember I was, uh, I was going up for tenure the first time around, and I was looking at another professor's file, someone I respected. And I was going through their file, and I was like, wow. Uh, because I had a, in CJ, we have a very different advising load. Um, I mean, now it's changed with the union, but you know, we, we carried 80 sometimes advisees. I would have over 80. I've had a hundred before. Um, that, that's not great. I'm not proud of that at all. It's not effective advising. But one of the things that I saw that this, uh, professor who's a full professor now did was at the end of the semester, they wrote a letter to their students about their grades. And I was like, wow, I mean, that is great. I mean, that, that's what we're talking about here. And I was like, I'm not doing this, you know, like, oh my gosh, I've got a lot of work to do. And so <clears throat> I don't always do that, but I'm trying to get better in those kinds of things where I'm giving them feedback or showing up at different things. Uh, so paying attention. Uh, you know, one of the more th most important things we can do is to learn to pay attention. That's kind of what I was just driving at there, becoming mindful. You know, when you're fully present with your students, they feel it. And that works in the classroom and outside the classroom. We are far more productive as well. So finding time for th things like meditate, following our breath, learning to pause. Sometimes what I will do is when I come into my classroom, right before I come into my classroom, I'll just take a minute take like 30 seconds and I'll stand there and I'll set an intention to be more present and aware to be more present with my students. Uh, I might do that, I've done that with my advisees. Um, putting up indicators in our office to remind ourselves to be more mindful, becoming active listeners. Active listening requires us to listen and provide ongoing positive regard. Repeating the question to ensure we are present, <coughs> listening with our whole bodies, and becoming aware, of, uh, becoming aware of our posture and how we're kind of uh, interacting with others. Um, one word in spiritual tradition they talk about is they call it bearing witness. You know, bearing witness to the process. And, uh, it, and it, that doesn't have to be, you know, new age spiritual kind of stuff. It's just, it's really being an active listener. Um, well, I'm not gonna do this exercise, I just thought about it, but you know, is an exercise for yourself to think about a tough moment in college and then a happy one. And sometimes I do this, you know, as, a, as an exercise is, is actually just listen. Like when I'm sort of going, yeah, 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 yeah. But just fully take in what the other is saying. You following me there? So I'm not, because a lot of time when we do, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like this nervous thing that I do, I'll speak for myself, it's kind of a, a nervous thing, like, oh my gosh, this is like kind of a big thing. As opposed to like just fully hearing what the human being is saying, because sometimes they're speaking with more than just their words, you know? Um, so, you know, last week I had some uh, tough advising moments where some people disclosed some things that uh, I certainly didn't know the conversation was gonna go there. You know, one about being somewhat homeless and facing that. Didn't know it was gonna go there. But I had to be present enough to allow it to go there. And that's what I'm talking about with paying attention. I could have just focused on the narrow task that we came in there for, which had to do with, you know, not a, a lack of preparation for the class and, and, and just talk about that. But the conversation, because in that moment I was, which, which isn't always the case, I was able to pay a little bit more attention and see that something else was going on that needed to be talked about. 
And that was the one that advised him about just to stay. Another model, appreciative advising. Uh, appreciative advising has its foundational roots in um, a kind of revolutionary human psychologist by the name of Carl Rogers. Rogers wrote a pretty famous book called On Becoming a Person in the 1960s. And he, he, um, he, he created a revolutionary counseling model that basically <laughs> tore up the counseling world because you actually didn't need a degree in counseling to be able to follow his model and to be effective with, student, with, with human beings. And, and this isn't to say that this is the only model that's effective with human beings. It's just one. But what he did was he, he came up with the idea that if you have ongoing positive regard for the human being that you're working with and you give that constant feedback, that that person on their own starts to develop insights into themselves uh, that they would never have otherwise. Um, so it's something that we just worked on a bit through paying attention. So this process is transformational because it allows us to be transformed in the process. Because we become humble enough to know that we have so much to learn from the students that we advise. So just by being that present, by honoring them, by showing them unconditional care and concern, um, you know, that we, in many ways, we come to love our students. Um, so basic assumptions of appreciative advising. Every student has the potential for academic success. Each student possesses unique strengths. Through exploration of their backgrounds, past experiences, present status and relationships, and sources of their own strength, uh, students must build upon their strengths after they've been identified. Uh, and you know, it's important to note that not all students have identified their strengths or how to use or develop them. So like giving them that confidence, right? You know, like how many times, I remember hearing a story about uh, Larry Bird, the great ex <coughs> basketball Hall of Famer, that, you know, he was just playing basketball outside. He was like in seventh grade. And he had a high school coach come over and say, you know, you're really good. And then that was it. He just, according to Larry Bird, he just started practicing day and night and like just took off and is one of the greatest players of all time. Um, so, you know, helping someone see that. I remember that worked with me, like, you have this real thirst for justice, philosophy, law. Have you thought about this? Like, whoa, wow, I didn't see that about myself, right? You know, and so uh, things take off. Can we give that student that gift, right? You know, and, and we all have permission to do that. You don't have to be qualified in some field, we can see it in human beings that, wow, that would be great. I, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard or I've talked to students and like, you know, you would be a great psychologist or you would be great in English literature. Oh my gosh, I mean, there, there are things that we don't have total expertise in that we can say, go pursue, go talk to Robin DeRosa about this. This would be awesome. You know, go talk to Jeremiah, God nursing, all of it. So anyway. Um, advisors play a huge role in a student's journey to optimize their educational experience and self-knowledge. The interaction between advisor and advisee will impact not only them, that's the neat thing about this model, but yourself, and you're open to that possibility. So advisor must develop consciousness of their own values and how that weighs into how they, uh, and how they advise. Yeah, I think to be an effective advisor, we've got we've to recognize where we're at, have our own little self-reflective process to see what we're bringing to the table. So, you know, it's a journey. Um, you're, you're, we're all, all teachers, whether you're uh, in the classroom or whether you're um, over in the, um, you know, academic success office, um, you have an opportunity to effectively ask questions and process with folks in a way where we will all learn and grow. And being willing to learn about ourselves, being willing to share our struggle and triumphs on the path. Thank you. Mm -hmm. With that, I am going to stop the broadcast and thank you all for tuning in.